thank you, God, for trusting me to be his dad. Thank you, Lord, that when a door closes, you're still going to take care of me. And thank you for cheetahs and pickles and fairings and mommies and daddy. Thank you, Father, <laughs> for always giving me perspective. I'm so sorry. Thank you, God, that you are the great physician of both my body and my soul. Father, thank you for knowing my family's needs even before I do. And for ladybugs and old people and Disney movies and Miss Walker and donuts. Thank you. Thank you for reminding me that I'm never alone. Thank you, God, for what I have. And also, I wouldn't mind an upgrade soon. Thank you, Father God, for love, joy, peace, and patience. Lord, especially patience. And thank you for Jesse, even though he's mean during recess. Help him find a good friend. That's what he needs. I love you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, God, for childlike faith. good. His love endures forever. I cannot believe that we are already in November. Uh, it, it blows my mind to think that in just a couple of weeks we will be uh, celebrating Thanksgiving together. This year, 2020 has been like no other, uh, most definitely, but one of the things I can say is it seems like it is just absolutely uh, flying by, and so uh, I am excited. I, first of all, I haven't got to preach in the last four weeks. I want to say a special thanks uh, to Brother Joe and to uh, Hunter uh, for preaching for me in the month of October, and both of you did absolutely amazing jobs, and I uh, can't begin to tell you how much I love and appreciate uh, both of you uh, men for, for doing that and for using the gifts and talents that God has given you. And, uh, but, it's, it, but it is good to, uh, to be able to be back and to be able to preach today. Let me go ahead and say while you're turning, turn over to Psalm 107. And while you're turning, I want to say to you as a church, thank you so much for uh, pastor appreciation and staff appreciation last week. Uh, absolutely overwhelmed Beth and I with uh, the cards and the love and everything that you as a church uh, have shown to us. And uh, it has been an absolute incredible 10 years. It really has. 
and uh, looking forward to, uh, to many more uh, being able to, uh, to be together and to share together with you. Also, want to remind you of something very important that happens this afternoon. Tonight at 6 o'clock, we have the absolute incredible privilege of ordaining a new deacon, Kurt Hicks. Uh, we will be ordaining Kurt Hicks uh, as a deacon this evening. So all of our ordained men, we're going to meet together in Larry Key Sunday School class at 4.30 this afternoon for our ordination council. Any uh, ordained men are invited to come and be a part of that. And uh, then uh, we will, uh, the ordination council will actually vote. And uh, assuming that they vote to continue with the ordination service tonight at 6 o'clock right here in the sanctuary, we'll be ordaining Kurt. And I am so excited. I ask you, encourage each and every one of you to please make sure and be here uh, for this great time tonight as we uh, support the Hicks family and as we support the ministry uh, that God is doing here at at First Baptist Church of Moody. So, uh, so excited to be a part of that. Well, over the next few weeks, as we get into our Thanksgiving series today, and we'll be beginning that, I'm going to be preaching through the 107th Psalm. Psalm 107. Now, <clears throat> for those of you that, and many of you probably know this, but the book of Psalms was actually a collection of five different psalm books that were uh, all put together and we have all 150 chapters that uh, comprise what we have now in scripture as the book of psalms well the 107th psalm begins the fifth and final quote unquote book of psalms and from there all the way to psalm 150 is this uh, this conglomeration of thanksgiving psalms. One of the overwhelming things that we're going to find, and we're going to definitely find it in the 107th Psalm, is thanking God for his incredible goodness. Now today I want us to just, just think about it as when you get into the month of November. One of the things that a lot of people like to do is they like to, every single day, they like to think of or talk about something that they are thankful for. Well, I don't, uh, I don't begin to try to ask each and every one of you to say that out loud right now, but no doubt, every single one of us have things in our life that we are extremely thankful for. I am extremely thankful for my family. I'm extremely thankful for First Baptist Church of Moody. I'm extremely thankful for my salvation. I'm thankful for my Savior that loves me unconditionally. There are so many things that we can list to be so thankful for. And I encourage you, we don't, by the way, we don't have to just take the month of November to do that each year anyway. We can be thankful and should be thankful each and every day for the things that God has, has blessed us with, for simply who he is. And, and we can lift our, our voices in thanks to him. So if you will, if you'll stand, we're going to look today at a passage of scripture that says, give thanks, you wanderer. And we're going to look at this. Let's read verses 1 through 9 together. It says, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. Those he redeemed from the hand of the foe. Those he gathered from the lands, from east and west, from north and south. Some wandered in desert wastelands, finding no way to a city where they could settle. They were hungry and thirsty, and their, their lives ebbed away. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way to a city where they could settle. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. For he satisfies the thirsty, and he fills the hungry with good things. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we love you so much. We do thank you for today. We thank you, God, for uh, the incredible blessings, Lord, that you have given us. We thank you, God, for just for you. And Lord, as we look at this passage of Scripture today, Lord, many of us uh, would, could consider our lives to be that of a wanderer. Lord, we've wandered back and forth. We've wandered into places we should not be. We've wandered into circumstances that we should have never found ourselves. But Lord, in the midst of our wandering, God, your unfailing love and your incredible goodness. 
Lord, have always been there. So God, we love you. We praise you in the precious and holy name of your son, Jesus. Amen, amen. You may be seated. I want us to look today at really three incredible aspects of this these verses of Scripture, there's three things, three incredible aspects here that I want to just simply encourage you with today. And I pray that as you leave here today, that truly you will be encouraged by the Word of God. Well, the first thing is this. Let's look at the overwhelming goodness of God. Look at verses 1 through 3 again. It says, Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. It says, his love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. Those he redeemed from the hand of the foe, those he gathered from the lands from east and west, from north and south. Well, there's, there's several things here that we want to talk about when we think about the overwhelming goodness of God. And the first is this, God is infinitely and eternally good. The first verse there, it's a verse that you find repeated many, 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 many times throughout the Psalms. The psalmist, as they're writing, as David is writing, as, as they're ministering together, you find this phrase, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. And it always says his love endures forever. I want to remind you of something as we get going today, as we get into this passage of Scripture. God is infinitely and eternally good. Now, how do you explain that? Well, there's really no way for me to try uh, in a 30-minute sermon to explain to you the completeness and the fullness of how incredibly and infinite God's goodness is. There's absolutely no way that we could ever uh, get to that point. But I encourage you to think about a lot of things. And there's, there's a couple of things that I want to really draw you to when it comes to the goodness of God. And the first thing is this. God is good regardless of your circumstances. Now, can I say that again? God is good, and really we could just put a period at the end of that. Regardless of your circumstances, regardless of the situations that you find yourself in, regardless of what this world is bringing down upon you, regardless of how you're feeling at that moment, regardless of what's going on in your life, God is infinitely and eternally good. Our circumstances do not dictate the goodness of God. I was... Um, looking at some, uh, some videos and things on YouTube this week from uh, Living Waters Ministry. It's a, it's a ministry that I, I've really grown to love. And, uh, but a guy by the name of Ray Comfort is sharing the gospel over and over and over and over. And he does it in some incredible, unique ways. And uh, his methodology behind how he shares the gospel is absolutely uh, incredible. He's known as a street preacher, uh, but I think he's far more than that. He's an incredible evangelist. But I was sitting and I was watching, and, and one of the overwhelming things that I saw as people were, were questioning, they were, uh, they were sharing the gospel with people, I saw two very overwhelming things. The first thing was this. Most of the people there felt like they were good people. On the opposite side of that, people who, especially those who did not know Jesus Christ as a personal Lord and Savior, those who lived in, 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 with the things of this world, they not only felt like they were a good person, but they always questioned the goodness of God. Well, I want to think about those for two very polar opposites there. First of all, Understand today that you and I, according to God's word, and if we're real honest with ourselves, according to us, we're not good people. 
What does it, what does it mean to be a good person? What does it mean when we're sharing the gospel and somebody says, well, you know, I'm a good person. Here's the thing. Here's what most people are hoping for. They're hoping that at the point in time when we pass away, that we have enough goodness in our life that somehow we can tip the scales of eternity and somehow we can be just 51% on the good side and it tilts us over and God will somehow allow us into heaven because of the good things that we have done. Very few times do you go and ask somebody, are you a good person, that they're going to look at you and say, nope, I'm a horrible person. Very few times. But here's the thing. We're all sinners. Scripture even teaches that there are none righteous, no, not one. You and I are not, in the definition of it, good people. Now let's flip the switch. Because it was very interesting to me in these videos, the number of people that claimed that they were good people, the equal number of them also turned around and said, because of the evil things that we see in this world, because of wars, because of, uh, of all the chaos that we see in America and in the world today, because of things like the COVID-19, because of things like cancer, because of things like divorce, because of things like, and you just fill in the blank, they said because these things are present in our world, though we think we are good, God could not be good. Now, as I sat and I thought about that and I thought about all the videos that I was watching, it, it doesn't surprise me to see that we, and, and all of these videos took place here in the United States. It doesn't surprise me to see that we in the United States have a very warped view of A, who we are, and B, who God is. I want to remind you of something today, folks, and it goes back to that first part. Your and I circumstances, the circumstances that we find in America and in the world today, the circumstances you might find when you go to the doctor's office, the circumstances that we find flooding the streets of America today, they do not define the goodness of God. They point out the evil nature of man. We've got it totally opposite. God is infinitely and eternally good. In verses 2 and 3, you and I as believers are to both portray, uh, portray and proclaim his goodness. Look at verse 2 and 3. Let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. The Hebrew language there it says it like this. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let those who have been redeemed by the saving love of God, let those who live their life by faith, let them proclaim the goodness of God. Those he gathered, verse 3, from the lands, from east and west, from north and south. Listen, not only is God infinitely and eternally good, but you and I have been called as believers to both portray and proclaim how do you do those two things? Well, we, we know the proclaim part. That's the things that we say. We are to verbally say. We are to let our voices be heard. We are to be that voice crying out in the wilderness that proclaims the goodness of God. But here's the problem. Never allow your voice to proclaim that which your life is not living. I believe wholeheartedly that is why everybody or many or so many in America have lost the true perspective of the fact that they think we are good and God is not. It's because we have far too many people who make a proclamation from their mouth that they do not live in their life. The overwhelming goodness of God. Well, number two is this, our desperate need for God's goodness. Look at verses four through five. Verse four says this, some wander in desert wastelands, finding no way to a city where they could settle. Folks, I want you to know that without him, we have no direction. Now, I want you to hold on to that because we're going to see something in a minute. 
And I'm going to bring you back to that verse. But without God, we have no direction. I was sitting and listening to various things, and, and there's so many directions that we can go with this. I was sitting and listening to uh, some people who were talking about the fact that with upcoming elections and all of this, and listen, I, I'm not here to tell you who to vote for, which side to vote for. That's not, that's not my job up here, and I certainly won't do that. But here's what I heard some people say. They said, you know, you as Christians need to separate your church and your religion from the other parts of your life. And let me simply say this. I cannot separate my walk with Christ from any part of my life. My walk with Christ guides me as a husband. My walk with Christ guides me as a father. My walk with Christ guides me as a pastor of this church. My walk with Christ guides me in the things that I do in this world. My walk with Christ is not something that I can separate from me and say, you know what, I'm going to set aside my beliefs. I'm going to set aside my walk with Christ, and I'm going to live this part of my life without it you can't do that so what does that mean that means that your walk with Christ should be evident at your workplace that means that your walk with Christ should be evident at Walmart that means that your walk with Christ should be evident when absolutely no one else is looking it's not something we take a break from you see, without God, we have absolutely no direction. First part of verse 5, without him, we have no fulfillment. Look at the first part of verse 5. It says, they were hungry and thirsty. Without God, we are never satisfied. You know why this world has such problems with things like alcohol, with drugs, running from relationship to relationship to relationship. You know why, this, why our nation, I'll even throw our nation into this. You know why our nation struggles with this so bad? Because there's an emptiness that is inside of each and every one of us. And to fill that emptiness inside, we turn to every direction you can imagine. I talked to somebody a couple of weeks ago who said these exact words. They said, the only relief that I'm able to find is when I go to the liquor store and get my daily dose of my whiskey. Quote. My next words, probably not as compassionate as they should have been, but my next words were this, and how far has that gotten you? You know why we do that? We're trying to feel, feel an empty void that's in our life. We're trying to fill an emptiness that we have inside. We're trying to fill up this void that we have. And so we'll go from relationship to relationship to relationship, thinking that somehow I'm going to get into a bit in the midst of a relationship that's going to give me fulfillment. Or we will try this and this and this, drugs and all of this, trying to, trying to find a place and a way that, that we can get fulfillment in that. Or we'll try all, folks, I'm telling you, the only place you'll ever find it is with God. You see, without God, we have no direction, but without God, we also have no fulfillment, no satisfaction. Next part of verse 5, without him, we have no hope. Verse 5 again says they were hungry and thirsty, and then it says this, and their lives ebbed away. I said a number of times, in hospital rooms with people who were passing away. Most of you know, but some of you may not. I spent about four and a half years uh, as a clinical chaplain with St. Vincent's Health System. And one of the things uh, that I did each and every day was when we had someone who was passing away, I would go and I would spend time with that family and I would spend time with that person. 
can't tell you the number of times I would go to a room and there would be a worship service going on. You could always tell. There was people outside the door. They was always singing. There was a, it, was, it was almost a celebration, not a celebration of somebody dying, but a celebration of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who in the midst of the valley of the shadow of death brings absolute victory. And so we would go and we would sit and, and we would just worship together. You know the interesting thing? I didn't have to do a lot of ministry in those rooms. I did the ministry of kind of standing to the side. I did the ministry of just kind of sitting back because you could watch the power of God as it was at work. But then there was other times. There was other times. I'll never forget there was this one time we had somebody come into the emergency room. And they had not survived a car accident. I did whatever, what I always did as they were in the back working with the patient. I went to the prayer room. And as soon as all the family began to arrive, they would come into that room. And I was in there. You never know exactly what's going to happen in those moments. But I could tell just by the language and the things that I was hearing as they were coming in the room, that I did not feel like they had at least a walking relationship with God. And my job was to tell them that their mother had just lost her life in a car accident. I'm standing in this little room, and it's not a very large room. And I've got three or four sons that are there and several others. And I share with them that their mother has just passed away. And all of a sudden, one of those sons takes his fist and swings it as hard as he can at me. I'm glad I ducked. He hit the wall behind us and there was a hole in the wall for a long time. You know why he did that? Did he do it out of anger? No. Did he do it because he was mad at me? No, I had nothing to do with it. It's the reaction of people who have absolutely no hope. Our hope is in Christ alone. Our hope is in Christ and Christ alone. Without him, we have no direction. We have no fulfillment. And I promise you, we have no well, we've seen the overwhelming goodness of God. We've seen our desperate need for God's goodness. In verses 6 through 9, I want us to see God's goodness in the midst of our great need. Verses 6 through 9 are absolutely incredible. In fact, they ought to give you such incredible encouragement today. Verse 6 tells us this, that in Christ we have, or in God we have, deliverance. Look at verse 6. In the midst of where they're hungry and thirsty and their lives have ebbed away, verse 6 says this, Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. In God we have deliverance. The word delivered here in the Hebrew is the word not sal. It's an incredible word. The actual meaning behind this word means to rescue. It means to rescue someone. It means to rescue you. I've never been at a point where I had to be rescued. I don't know if any of you have. They say it is one of the most um, exhilarating and, and exhausting times in your life. I don't know if you've ever been at a point where you almost drowned and somebody reaches in to rescue you or you've been in a burning car and somebody pulls you out and they rescue you. But this is what this, this word literally means. It means that in the midst of your distress, in the midst of your troubles, in the midst of your heartache, in the midst of the fact that we have no hope in this world, through God, He reaches out and He rescues us. Another word for that is, is, is to snatch from danger. I love that. You ever thought about that? That God literally 
takes you and I in the midst of our sin, when we're destined for eternity, separated from God in hell, and he rescues us and he snatches us from danger. God's goodness in our need, there's deliverance. Uh, But the next thing, verse 7, there is direction. Look at verse 7. He led them by a straight way to a city where they could settle. Now remember, I told you a second ago when we read verse 4, I wanted you to hold on. Let's look at verse 4 and compare these two. In verse 4, those who had no relationship with God, it said they wandered in desert wastelands, finding no way to a city where they could settle. And remember, I told you, without God, there is absolutely no direction. But then they called upon the name of the Lord. And then look at verse 7. He led them by straight way to a city where they could settle. Can I tell you something? What our nation, what our world needs to cry out for is for God. In everything that we have, in everything that we do. We cry out to God for direction. Number three, there's unfailing love. Look at verse eight. It says, let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. I love this. This phrase that you have there, unfailing love, it's the Hebrew phrase kased. And it literally is an all-encompassing word for the attributes of God. I got very interested in this, and so I began to do, I pulled out my Strong's Concordance, and I began to look up this word called said, and how many times it was used throughout the Old Testament, and, what, and how it was translated. And it was extremely uh, eye-opening for me. It was, it was described as unfailing love. It was described as God's faithfulness it was described as God's mercy it was described as God's grace it was described as God's favor and I said and I watched all of these words and what I realized is this is a word that is all encompassing for the incredible goodness of who God is there is unfailing love let them give thanks to the Lord for his un failing love can I draw you to something real quick many of us struggle to believe that God can love us like he really does think about the worst sin that you have in your life the one that's tucked away that you pray nobody ever sees now I'll be an open door for you and by telling you this I have those things in my life as well. I've had people say to me, Preacher, I hope hope that you never find out about some of the things that I've done. And I always say the same thing. I pray you never find out about some of the things I've done as well. Think about those things in your life, those sins in your life, those that shock you that you would have ever done those. Those that would be absolutely shocking if everybody found out about it. Now I want to draw you to something. God's unfailing love is even greater than that. The areas in your life that you beat yourself up over, the areas in your life that you seem to can't, you, that you can't get beyond, the areas in your life that cause you to lay awake at night wondering how could I have done this? Those of you that have children and can remember back when they, were, when they were little. Remember how you would sit back and you would watch your kids struggle with something? Struggling with those areas that you couldn't fix. It seems like they came on big time when they got into, into middle school area. They would get into the middle, middle school area and, you know, and, and they would be, be bullied or somebody would be making fun of them or, or you know, and you, you know those times when you as a parent wanted to go up and, and absolutely destroy a 12-year-old. You know what I'm talking about? We've had those moments before in our lives. 
And you sit back and you're in prayer and you sit back and you're worried and you sit back and you're looking at your child. Do you know that God loves us that much? God is looking at us with an unfailing love. It's that all-encompassing that encompasses everything God is. Well, verse 9 tells us that there is complete fulfillment. Look at verse 9. And Jonathan, you guys come on up and begin to play. Verse 9 says this, For he satisfies the thirsty and fills the hunger with good things. Compare that to the first part of verse 5. In the first part of verse 5, it's describing what it's like to have that life outside of God. And it said outside of God, they were constantly hungry. They were constantly thirsty. Their lives were ebbing away. Everything was destroyed. Everything was, was without hope. And then they call upon the name of the Lord. And he says in that last part, he satisfies their hunger. He satisfies their thirst. He satisfies their needs. Because of God's infinite and eternal goodness, you are infinitely and eternally loved. Can I say that again? Because of God's infinite and eternal goodness, you are infinitely and eternally loved. Scars and all. You know how you look in the mirror and you you see something looking back at you that nobody else sees. You see the hurt that's inside of you. You see the struggles. Hunter was talking in in one of his sermons a couple of weeks ago that sometimes we come into the church and we place that mask upon our face. That mask that says to everybody, we're okay. That mask that says, we've got it all together. That mask that says, I'll make it today. But yet we're staring into the mirror And we take that mask back off and we set it aside. And we see the things that are hidden. We see the scars. We see the pain. Can I ask you to do something? I want to ask you to look beyond the scars. Look beyond that pain that you see. Look beyond that unfulfillment. And look to an old rugged cross. With tears flowing down his face, I had a guy in my office not very long ago. And he said this, these words, How could God love me I took him to no place other than the cross of Calvary I looked at him and I said I want you to think about something I want you to imagine in your mind a hill called Calvary I want you to imagine your Savior carrying an old rugged cross to that hill. I want you to visualize Jesus laying down on that cross as they, as they pound the spikes through his hands. 
I said, I want you to see your Savior as that cross is lifted up and there suspended between heaven and earth is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I told him, I said, as gruesome as it is, I want you to get a visualization of the blood that's being shed for you. And then I told him, I said, I want you to look at me. And I asked him, I said, do you have that visual? And he said he did. And I told him, I said, you never have to question again then whether he loves you. His unfailing goodness. His eternal greatness. You see, it was Jesus who said these words, apart from me, you can do Nothing. But what does Philippians 4.13 say? In Him, I can do all things through the strength, through the power, through the greatness, through the goodness, through the love of God as my Savior.